All right, kids, so let's have a very, very, very quick review of gas laws. So uh, let's kind of start with a little basic stuff that you have PV equals NRT, which you all have seen before. So this is why this is just going to be a pretty basic one. So if there's ever a physical quantity in science that has an identity crisis, it's pressure. Okay, it literally is. So let me kind of give a quick refresher of this. So one atmosphere, which is what you're used to living under, is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. And where that came from is that how they used to measure pressure is that they had a tube and it sat in a pool of mercury liquid mercury to be exact. And so under normal atmospheric pressure, it would push this up to a height of 760 millimeters of mercury. And so, and, and here's the cool part of this in terms of how this actually plays out, is that you have your atmosphere, okay, creating of nitrogen and oxygen, and no, there's no such thing as air molecules okay let's just get that straight right now do not ever call it this air molecules and so basically you have billions upon billions upon billions of these pushing down so when you have high pressure then you have more of this pushing down and the barometric pressure would literally rise up if you have low pressure and this was an indication of like bad weather then you don't have as many molecules hitting the surface of the mercury and the pressure would drop. So high pressure systems, here's your meteorological tie-in. High pressure systems are generally associated with fair weather because you have sinking air and then low pressure is usually associated with storms because that air is rising up in a convection current. So you're never gonna have to know this for the AP exam. This is just kind of general knowledge. And then that can also be listed as 760 TOR. Okay, millimeters of mercury and tor are the same thing. Now, that is also equal to 101,300 pascals. For those of you that remember your physics, that's also 101,000, oh my bad, 101,300 newtons per square meter, otherwise known as pascals. And in terms of your air pressure in your tires, that's 14.7 pounds per square inch. Uh, typically your air, your air pressure in your tires is usually about 35 PSI. So there's that. Um, in terms of your volume in physics, this is gonna be in cubic meters, but for, since we're in AP chemistry, this is gonna be in meters. So that's what's gonna drive your value of R. So if you're doing the ideal gas law constant and you're in a chemistry class, you wanna make sure that you're using 0 0.0821 atmosphere liters per mole Kelvin, okay? So make sure that you are paying attention to this because that means this side over here has to be in atmosphere liters. So if you're going to use this as your gas law constant, you have to be in atmosphere liters over here. N is your number of moles and T is going to be your temperature in Kelvin. So hopefully that's kind of an old school review of uh, the gas law. Now, typically how these play out is that you begin to change things. And most of the time what's going to happen if you look at PV equals NRT, typically your NR is going to remain constant. Uh, you're generally not going to change the number of moles and you're certainly not going to change the gas law constant. That's why it's called constant. So if you have two different situations, typically what you can do is move this T over here. So you'd have P1, T1, 
Excuse me, I screwed that up. It's been a long day. P1, V1 over T1 equals NR, which also equals P2, V2 over T2. So typically your NR is going to be a constant, okay? So what that means is like if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So this is kind of the cool way to get what's known as the combined gas law. And then you can isolate anything out of this. So if there's one kind of a catch-all thing that you're going to look at, it's this. So typically what you're going to do is it's rare on the test and I'm guessing they're going to change more than one of these. So the beauty of this is like, let's say, for example, you're going to keep the temperature the same and you're going to look at a change in, say, pressure. So you might have a pressure of uh, one atmosphere and that volume is, I don't know, two liters. And then you're going to change, you're going to increase that pressure to four atmospheres and you want to figure out, hey, what's going to happen to that new volume, okay? So assuming that your temperature is going to stay constant, you don't have to worry about this. So what that means is that you have P1V1 equals P2V2. So if you want to figure out what this new volume is going to be, and we'll just do the pure math on it first, and then we'll talk about the logic of it later. So you've got P1V1 over P2 equals V2. So I'm going to have one eighth atmosphere times that volume of two liters. And then I'm going to divide that by my new pressure of four atmospheres. So I get a new volume of a half a liter. Because two divided by four, the last time I checked, should be a half. Now, so there's the pure math on it. Now, if you think about it logically, okay, if you think about it logically, look at what's happening, okay? Remember, what's creating pressure are, if you go back to your second graders named Timmy, so what's creating the pressure inside this room, and this is like looking down on the top of the room, is that you've got all these little Timmys bouncing around on the side of the walls, okay? All right. So now what's important is that we're going to keep the temperature the same. So we're not going to change the number of Skittles that Timmy has available to him. The Timmy's are going to be operating with the same amount of kinetic energy. So, but you have to keep in mind kind of a visual about what creates pressure. So pressure sensors work by particles coming in and think of this as like a golf ball coming in and hitting that surface and then bouncing off. Okay, and every time that happens, that creates a certain amount of pressure on this sensor, okay? Now, so with that said, if you look at what's happening in this scenario, you had pressure one with a volume of two liters. So th this is like the size of the room. So what's happening here is that we've increased the pressure. So, since we're not changing the kinetic energy of Timmy, because we're not changing the amount of Skittles that he has, what we're doing is that to increase, to get this increase in the pressure, the only way that can happen is if these particles are bouncing off more frequently. Well, the only way we can do that then is to physically shrink the size of the room because if you're, if we shrink the size of the room then the kids are going to be more likely to run into the walls because of the fact that there's less space so if you want to think of this in terms of timmies that's what you've got going there so if you look at let's let's talk about the temperature so let's change that so if you have uh let's say your pressure one is i don't know 
1.8 atmospheres at a temperature of, let's say, 20 degrees Celsius, which would be 293 Kelvin. And then let's say that we want to find that new pressure and we're going to increase that temperature to 303 Kelvin. Okay, so I'm just making up some numbers here. So uh, now if you look at that, where you have P1, V1 over T1. Hold on, it's been a long day. Yeah, T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. So we're assuming that we're going to keep the volume the same. So in other words, we're not going to change the size of the room. We're going to keep the kids in the same classroom. Okay, that's kind of cool. So now, if you look at what's going to happen. So now, think this through. So if we had a pressure of 1.8 atmospheres and 293 Kelvin, we're going to raise the temperature. So we're going to give these kids more energy. So that means that these collisions are going to be happening more often. So I've got to figure that that pressure here is going to be higher than 1.8 atmosphere because I've overloaded the kids with sugar. There's going to be more pressure. Now, so if we do a little cross multiplication, we get P1 T2 equals P1 or P2. I'm sorry, my bad. P2 times T1. Now, if you look at what's happening, we've got on the, on the left side, we've got 1.8 atmospheres, and we're going to multiply that by T2, which is going to be 303 Kelvin. And then we're going to have pressure 2, which is our unknown, times 293 Kelvin. So if you look at this kind of visually, over, over here, I've got a small pressure and a bigger temperature. So the only way this can balance out is if I have over here, I've got a smaller temperature. So that means I have to have a bigger pressure. So because of that equality sign, that's the only way this thing can work out. So in terms of how this deal will work, now if you actually do the math, so give me a second. I'm going to do a little bit of math here. So it's late on a Tuesday night, and I can't do this in my head. 0.8 times 303 divided by 293. I get that new pressure to be 1.86 atmospheres. Okay? Which should hopefully then make sense. Okay, um, in terms of standard temperature and pressure, gas laws are a little bit different, okay? So at gas laws, the standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which is 293 Kelvin, excuse me, 273 Kelvin, my bad, 273 Kelvin. So what that means is that if you have one atmosphere of pressure and you have, uh, and you're, let's say you want to find the volume, okay, and let's let that be our unknown, and we have one mole of gas and we're at 273 Kelvin, and we have the gas law constant of 0.0. 8206. Six, imagine that's all written there. So if you do the math here, you get a volume of 22.4 liters. So this is what's known as Avogadro's law, which says that one mole of gas under standard temperature and pressure will occupy 22.4 liters. So here's what's important about that. It doesn't make any difference what the type of gas is. Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, helium, whatever, it doesn't make any difference. So Avogadro, here's the dichotomy, or the weird thing about Avogadro's number, is that Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But he never actually came up with the number. All he did was that he proposed that if you have one mole of any type of gas, 
it's going to contain the same number of particles. So we never actually found the number. He just proposed that idea. So there's a little bit of trivia. Okay, kids, I've been talking for a while, and uh, I'm tired. So this is just the beginning of the Gas Law Lectures. There will be more. I'll also send out some uh, other stuff that go with this. So, all right, I'm